Okay, welcome, Paris of ESU8. We're glad to have you joining us again today. Um, a couple things before we get started. For those of you who weren't here earlier, we we're actually we're supposed to be in a room today, but there's another um, group of people finishing up in the room we were supposed to be in. So we're actually out in a hallway, very familiar to probably most of you. So. Um, we just ask for your patience as people may be walking in and out of the room. We're actually at the Lifelong Learning Center. So we may have to pause at certain moments just to get um, quiet back, I guess. So uh, again, thank you for your patience. Um, and another thing is, um, if you guys would mind um, unmuting your video so that we could, could see faces. At the end of this um, little session today, we're gonna ask you to kind of participate in a discussion with us um, so that we can uh, get your feedback as well as um, kind of share out as a group. So be keeping that in mind as we go throughout the presentation. Um, and we'd like to see your faces, but maybe you can leave your voices on mute until it's your turn to talk. Otherwise, we've seen that we get a lot of feedback, so. Yep, and we can also on our end unmute you. So we may, we may manage it that way so that we don't have a lot of feedback, um, so. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, I'm Steph, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about helping students with focusing attention, impulse control, and self-monitoring. Yes, and I'm sure that that's really not a problem with any of the students that you work with, right? Aha, right. uh -huh, you can laugh there. <laughs> Especially this time of year when they really want to do on Christmas, to go outside, and Look at and um, they Look really at have a hard time self-monitoring with those warnings about Santa right. watching. Sometimes Again, help. <laughs> and then right, you probably we have do. elves in the classroom. I know that that's a popular yeah. one. So we have a great video that's not going to work for us today for this training, but if you go back to the presentation and look at it later, what you're going to see is this poor little dog's just trying to drink at his water bowl, and another dog comes through just running laps, and every now and then the dog glances up like, who is that? What is that? Where's yeah. that one going? Sorry. Um, I think that you can relate that to a lot of your students who um, who seem to be running those laps all day long and have a hard time focusing their control. And and in respect of the other students grabbing the other attention, mm -hmm. the students' attentions as well, which um, you're trying to get them focused on. So go back and watch the video. It's really cute. Quietly, if you are finished. So um, executive function is kind of a new buzzword in education. And actually, we were just with a bunch of super superintendents today we they were having some yeah. about what executive function is um, this year um, I offered three trainings um, with a lot of schools probably from your districts that attended but actually their brain processes that really they drive our ability to focus solve problems organize ourselves remember information learn from mistakes okay third grade you need and to if line you start up. to think about kids who have trouble with learning I bet you you could point at at least one of those spots there in that first bullet point that they have trouble with. Um, and so oftentimes this learns, uh, leads to uh, trouble learning efficiently and developing those social skills. Um, and then if we can understand how they develop, um, it helps adults figure out our best responses to those academic and behavioral problems. Um, oftentimes, I think these are the kids who are slipping through the cracks, the kids who might not be identified as a SPED student, um, but they're having um, learning problems due to these um, functions. And sometimes um, it's just a matter of teaching them how and when to deal with those, and that's kind of where you guys come in. All right. All right, so um, these executive functions are actually um, controlled by the front part of your brain. And it's actually the brain's cueing system to higher level um, skills and thoughts. And so if you don't have those um, skills developed, you can't connect to we those can't higher thoughts. We can't hear you here at Lynch. So um, again, it's part of our neural circuits. Um, um, and they directly control things like perceptions, thoughts, actions, and to some degree, even our emotions. So oftentimes kids who have troubles with these executive function skills, um, they get called careless and rigid and inflexible or slow to change. 
Um, it's really easy to jump and put a label on those kids, but um, uh, actually they might have a skill that's missing that's not allowing them to do some of these things. And, you know, I go back, when I think of some of these things, I go back to teaching in the classroom and I myself made these um, assumptions about the child when there's something, I guess you say deeper, going on that um, we're gonna talk about today. So um, with poor attention and focusing skills, it might, um, as I read over this list of things that you might see in students, really try to reflect on the students that you work with and that you see. Um, are you seeing them exhibit some of these things? Um, so are there students who have um, their mind wanders during conversations? Um, they kind of might be described as a daydreamer. Um, do they overlook the details? Um, and they, you know, they just hear a main, main point, but they don't hear the details. Um, maybe that's in following directions too. Um, they're unable to think on their feet and come up with a quick response or a quick um, idea to write about or something like that. Um, and they usually have one speed, which makes them sometimes seem kind of oblivious, like uh, I'm in slow-mo here and they don't know the answer. Sometimes they even have energy surges, which make them overact, overreact. So um, they just go to from, from zero to 10 really fast and they get very hyper and overreact about something. Maybe they're calm at one minute and the next minute they are enraged and to the point of not knowing how to control them. Um, they could be confused about why they work so hard, but they don't get anything done. Like I seem to think I've been busy working on something, but I always have tons of homework. I'm never done with things. Um, they might struggle to understand why they don't fit in and they can't make friends. They might come up to you on the playground and say, nobody likes me. I can't, they never let me play. And I can think about times on the playground when I was there that that's a, oftentimes a, a complaint from some kids. Also, they're unaware of uh, the things that they do that others find annoying. They don't know that, uh, you know, that they're a piece of this puzzle. And they often struggle with reading comprehension because if you think about it, when we're reading, we have to really give it a lot of attention and a lot of focus, and we have to pay attention to those details. And these kids struggle with that. Especially when you're talking about the lower um age groups because again like Stephanie said the in order to read and to understand what you're reading the focus has to be there and otherwise they're not going to get anything out of what they read because their mind's wandering um, so real quick here I want to address a chat going on do you guys are you guys okay with hearing us now some of you were having some trouble with background noise possible okay we're good give me a thumbs up if we're good oh, okay wonderful okay. thank you we're guys. seeing some thumbs now great thank Thanks. you thank you Okay, so when we um, talk about kids with that poor attention and focus, oftentimes our kids can fall into about three main categories here. So um, the first category is the kid that doesn't even know what to focus on, okay? Um, so they're unable to relate to new things. Um, you know, again, they might hear that main idea, but they couldn't tell you any details. And oftentimes that might be even a kid who comes home from school and the mom says, what do you do to learn today? And they say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I did, and I know that's way too many kids, so, um, but some of these kids really focus on that, and so how we can help if the kids don't know what to focus on, it's things like having a highlighter there, and maybe we're going to go through a text, and we're going to highlight some material, and um, of course, we're not going to write in books, but we can always make copies. Um, we might do something like underlining the main points, and having kids go back and look at what they've underlined. And covering extra content or even highlighting uh, different details about the content that they're, they're trying to understand. Um, and and note-taking practices teach them how to take notes or how to take notes that work best for them. There's lots of note-taking systems, so that's something that I would refer to the teachers that you work with. Um, or if there are some that you want to know in particular, contact one of us later and we can get you a lot of different ways that kids can take notes. Um, 
they might need to do a verbal um, summary of what they've read. So, hey, we've just read one column of text. Let's go ahead and summarize what we've just read, or we've read a part of the chapter. Let's go over it out loud and, and summarize it. If they do that along the way, it'll help them. Um, and then we can activate prior knowledge and ask them, have you ever heard of this kind of thing before? Um, does it relate to something that you already know about the world or another book or another subject? And I think this one is an important one for your students because if you can do that in the beginning of a conversation or a beginning of a skill and, and get them to make that connection, then they're going to apply that connection throughout the lesson or throughout the reading, whatever it is that you're doing um, as you go throughout the rest of the lesson. So I, I, that one's important, I think, for a lot of students. It helps them relate. And then also to repeat the objective and what to focus on. So if the teacher has stated an objective for the lesson of the day, um, that might be something that you have to um, ask the kid about again and say, hey, now what are we really trying to focus on today? What are we really trying to learn? And having them repeat that to you is important. And you know, something I thought about when we talked about summaries, not just verbal, but also write little sticky notes and write like a sticky note a page um, and um, say, okay, we're gonna summarize this page on the sticky note and then we're gonna put all of our sticky notes together and we should have a really nice summary of the chapter or I don't know, the novel we're reading or whatever. And I think something as we go throughout these different examples too to keep in mind is you, you should try you may have go through all of these and try and only one will work for that kid but th these are all ones that you could try to help them out and then then they'll learn what works mm -hmm. best for them but you you may not be able to just utilize one you'll have to go through some different ones and see what works best for that student and sometimes it takes using it a few times to get to know really what works best for that student so don't give up fast and I realized most of these examples were for a little bit um, uh, older kid, if you're thinking about preschool, um, something is, if, if they're supposed to focus on something, say, in the story that the teacher's reading, just ask them about that. Be very verbal with it where um, they don't have the writing skills quite yet in, in, kid, in preschool. Yep. Or, or having them draw a picture mm -hmm. of what it is that they think that they've read or what, what it is they think mm -hmm. they've learned. That's picture summaries yeah. yeah okay so our second kind of kid is that kid who can't sustain their focus so they might get started but they can't keep going okay so that's oftentimes um, a problem for some kids in other words they have poor endurance so um, if you have that kid who gets started and then loses focus sometimes we might even call that kid um, you know, that they, they, that they have a short attention span or something. But we really need to focus on and keeping them engaged. So um, one thing is you might add some movement in. Some of those are, are squirrely or kids who just need to move around. And so maybe every time that they're gonna do part of the summary, um, we're gonna just take another step. Maybe we're gonna do it standing up. Some boys, they just need to stand instead of sit. Isn't it amazing? Yes. But, um, so if you stood up with a book and they could read part of it to you and then take a step or, you know, I even think, you know, I did this a couple times with a student is, Hey, let's have a conversation about this as we walk to the, to the water fountain and get a drink and then come back. And I, I think sometimes just, um, being able to to move their body and, and to process while they're moving helps. Or it might be that you're reading a chapter and answering some questions. Read the chapter at their desk and then move to like a table in the room to answer the questions. It can be just that simple. That just that movement gets them up, gets them just breathing again, and it's helpful. And there's brain studies like in the executive function that um, have proven that these are um, things that can work for students because they talk about the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic movements and each student or each kid can learn differently through those avenues. I'm um, also setting some goals and planning out the steps and telling the kids, hey, this is what we're gonna do first. Um, after that, we're going to do this. And after that, we're gonna do this. So, um, so it's important that we set that out and let kids kind of plan out their thoughts. Um, and that might relate to a task chart. 
okay? So if there's something that you do, say, every day at a certain time, um, kids could relate really well to having a little chart with those things in their desk and maybe making a check mark when they get something done. You know, I feel really accomplished when I can check mark my to-do list, and kids will too. And um, again, for those kids that have a hard time seeing the end, you know, they feel lost in the middle, um, it really helps them. And the last one is brain breaks. I bet a lot of teachers that you work with are using brain breaks these days. And when they are carefully planned out, um, they can be really um, effective for kids. So just get up, get breathing in some fresh oxygen, uh, move around a little bit, and then refocus. Yeah, and that's, I mean, if your teachers have used, like in the lower class, in fact, in the middle school, teachers have used the Go Noodle as a resource for that. But there's, there's a lot of tools out there that you could utilize as well to give them just those, and the brain breaks don't have to be a long break. It's just a time to get the, their brain refocused in, in three minutes, was, really. Yeah. Go Noodle's fun. Um, in my classroom, I would take a theme that we were going off of and, um, you know, have the kids act something out for a few minutes. Yeah. Um, and I'll never forget, I had one student asked to go to the restroom and we started in on a brain break. And when he re-entered, the kids were acting out different zoo animals, walking across the floor. And he looked at me, this kid walks in from the bathroom, looks at me and like, what have I just walked into? Is this Jumanji here? <laughs> <laughs> so brain breaks can be a lot of fun and get you going. But brain breaks can be simple as a walk to the water fountain, a walk to the bathroom, just a quick little, let's do something else for a minute. And we're going to talk about a little bit later, um, identifying some of those cues um, where you'll identify when and when you need to do these or when the kids need mm -hmm. to, to do this. So. And then we have the kid that has a poor transition skills. So they just can't get refocused on a new task. Um, that, that lack of flexible thinking that they get so locked into one thing uh, when the situation changes and they need to work on something else, it's really hard to get them to switch. And I bet you've had some students <laughs> like that over the years. Um, so one thing is to start a timer and kids really respond well to being able to watch a clock count down and see, okay, my teacher says I have two minutes left to work on this. And then they kind of just mentally prepare for that. Um, also, they can have a written or picture schedule. Okay, so written schedules, obviously, for older kids. Um, this is really important for high school kids. Think about how much their schedule changes during the day. And so we kind of sometimes make assumptions that they're a high school kid, they're a junior high kid, they should know where they're supposed to go in. Well, they probably need to write it down. And mm -hmm. I mean, I was a kid who probably didn't, my teachers wouldn't say I, I struggled with this, but I always had to have a schedule written or I would forget things. So let's really teach those older kids this skill. And then littler kids, let's draw some pictures and let them follow through their day or through maybe a certain time of the day with some pictures. And I think the picture schedule for those younger kids, especially when we're talking pre-K, um, if you can have the picture schedule where you can actually remove the picture when something's done, um, that helps them really focus in on the idea that we're, okay, we're putting this task to rest and we're ready to move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. And triage is a um, kind of cool thing I was been telling Tina a little bit about, but um, I used the BIST behavior model at one of my school districts, and um, a, a component of that is called triage. Um, so basically, um, triage is catching the kid and helping them out before they run into trouble. So um, for instance, I had um, a student with autism that I worked with. Um, he was in my homeroom. And we had a lot of structures, and the day was really planned out, and so he always knew what to expect. And we had such a successful year together. But when he went to art class, he really struggled. Um, he didn't have the fine motor skills to help him um, in art class, and it just—I think it was exacerbated there. It just really brought um, brought um, to attention because he had to cut and he had to color and he had to draw with a pencil, and that was hard for him. And so he acted out. So before he went to that situation where he might have some trouble, I would pull him aside and I'd say, hey, now you're about to go to art class. What are some things that you're going to remember in art class when you start to get frustrated? And we'd walk through, you know, well, I'm going to take a break. 
well, I'm just going to remind myself that uh, my best is enough and things like that. We'd talk through the problems. And then he went in and his success rate really went up. We also did this with different kids. Um, maybe if they forgot to do their homework every night, they would triage with a uh, parent in the library or the secretary in the office before they went home and they talked through their homework, mm -hmm. showed them their planner, and showed them that they have their homework in their book bag. Well, this can really work um, for kids with poor attention and focus skills. So you could um, triage and say, hey, you know what, we're about to transition to this other activity. Um, it's going to be partner reading. And I know that sometimes with partner reading, you don't pay attention to the story or, you know, you have trouble paying attention or um, it's hard to focus on that story the whole time when a partner's reading. What are some things that you're about to do? And then Tina might say to me, well, I'm going to point with my finger. I'm going to look with my eyes and um, I'm going to try to glue my mind to that story. And I think that component right there is important for your kids to talk through and you just guide and you listen. Um, and I think for the, they are the ones that need to come up with the what should this look like, what needs to happen when I'm there. And, you know, if you think level wise, so um, – I do this a lot with my children at home and I have uh, younger children. So for pre-K, you know, I say, what is it that, you know, caused this thing to happen and how can it look different? What do we need to do different to make, to make the change? If you're thinking of high school, this is something that maybe if you're working with high school kids and you know they have a problem in this area, the triage may be just suggesting to them to go through this process themselves if they don't want to do it with you, but suggesting, you know, hey, think about what this next process should look like for you to have the most success. And they might not always have an adult with them as in those older grades to triage, but maybe it's just a little checklist that they read over. You know, if they can have it um, maybe um, typed up and inside a notebook, and they say, hey, I'm going to math class, and I have a hard time in the different activities there. These are the things I'm going to remember, and it's just printed out, just little reminders for them. That can help, and that way it's not so in their face and embarrassing as older kids get older. And so as we've gone through this so far, again, I want to remind you, be thinking about kids that you work with every day, um, and kind of be thinking about some of these components as, as far as uh, not being able to, uh, to focus on certain things, cannot sustain their focus, and has poor transitioning skills. And try to identify someone that you work with that may have one of these um, areas that, that is a concern for them. So again, we're gonna have a conversation at the end, and so this is gonna lead into that conversation. Okay. Um, and yes, Cindy, by the way, that was a test to see if you guys were able to focus yes. the audio, right? <laughs> Just kidding. It wasn't, but it was, it's a good test. Yep. Okay. So Go some ahead. of these kids, um, you know, we can look at, um, more skills that they're lacking that lead to that main category. So our first kids here that don't know what to focus on, they might lack that clear purpose for the text. They need to hear why they're doing it. Um, they um, might um, have troubles with um, seeing that prior knowledge. Um, they Just don't, connecting the prior mm -hmm. knowledge, yeah. They also, they don't see the importance in doing it at all. So we have to help them see that important. Um, and um, they can't inhibit direct distractors. That means something's distracting them and they are pin they're so in tune with that thing, like there might be a noise in the room. Or have you ever had the kids who they see a spider on the wall or something? And I try to just tell them it's Charlotte, but um, they are just fixated on it. Um, and those are the ones that, you know, I, I think of my husband always says with our youngest that it's a squirrel, you know, yeah, think squirrel. of a dog squirrel and <laughs> you're off, right? Those are the kind of kids that we're referring to. And also um, they might have um, a trouble um, focusing because of stress and not just stress at school, but stress in their life. So we have to think about those kids who are going home and, and 
there might not be supper and somebody might be fighting and um, they don't know if mom or dad will be home or um, that kind of thing. So that kind of stress really affects the kids and makes them kind of um, distractible, distractible that way. So we have to help them try to reduce that stress, focus on what's going on right now. That's all we can control is right now. Um, those kids that can't sustain their focus, um, uh, they can't break um, that large task into little chunks. So we have to help them see that. Sometimes even folding a worksheet, folding a paper, so they only see a few problems at a time. Yes, and sometimes those are the kids that when you lay a whole worksheet in front of them without covering it prior, it's like an instant panic for them. Um, they're also overwhelmed when um, too many skills are required. Maybe there's too many directions all at once, those multi-step directions. So they're like, just tell me it one step at a time. So maybe you're going to write them all down and then they'll go back to them and follow them. Um, they can't work for long periods without a break. Again, those are the kids, walk them to the water fountain. That's how, that's how simple it can be. Or, or have them take a note to the office, that kind of quick stuff. Um, they lack variety in ways to approach the task. So we might have to show them those new note-taking um, steps or um, a new way to do things. And they lack enough support to keep their frustration manageable. So we really have to help them manage that frustration. We're going to talk about that in a little bit too. And also they can't self-monitor their on-task behavior. And so kind of making them aware and then maybe even having that checklist that they um, keep track of their <coughs> Those kids with the poor transition skills, um, they uh, feel stressed uh, from fear of failure or unknown consequences. But what if I don't do it right? But what if I you know, that kind of thing. Have you seen that student before? The they student won't covering eat. up their paper too. So that yes, they won't even get started because they're afraid or yeah, they won't let you see it because you might tell them it's wrong. Um, they lack those clear goals and priorities. And when we can help them focus on goals and priorities, they will um, get better with this. They're unable to work without seeing a clear structure or pattern. So again, write out the steps that we're going to follow and let them keep track of where we're going. Yeah, free school kids, show them pictures of what we're going to do. Um, they can't use self-talk to plan before acting, okay? So we have to let them talk with us. And once they start talking with us, they get better at the self-talk. Uh, they have difficulty stopping one activity in order to start another. And I see that one with little kids, too. I think if you're a preschool para, you see this problem because they um, they say, no, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Yes. I don't want to move yet. And then it's mass panic. And mm -hmm. it can kind of go back up to the top where it's like, I'm not done yet. I'm not going to get it right. Um, that kind of thing. And a timer and things like that really do help with that. Um, also, they can't adjust to pace um, or plan to fit a new situation. So um, I was doing this at a slow pace, and now we have to do it quickly. And I'm fine with my flashcards if I'm doing them on my own and I can count up. But when we get to the time test, I panic and I act out. And I shut down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is where you definitely don't want to go. Okay, so first, before we move on to impulse control, I want to ask, are there questions that you have about poor attention and focus skills? Who has a question for me? If I had candy, I'd throw them through the computer to you. <laughs> Come on, guys. And if you have a question, you can just raise your hand and we can unmute you if you'd like. It's a lot of information. Nod your head if you have a student that you think lacks poor, um, attention and focus skills. Oh, now I see some responses. Okay, I think we've all dealt with those, and we've probably all been those at some point or another in our lives, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay, well, we'll move on here, and we're going to start talking about those kids who also, it's kind of related, they have poor impulse control and self-monitoring skills. So, like, ideally, we want kids to monitor themselves. We want them to um, be able to say, whoa, I'm getting a, a little bit out of hand here. I need to calm it down. <laughs> and we know that some of our most successful students do that, um, but some of our kids can't, and they react to everything that 
comes up. So they might be overreacting or underreacting to situations. Okay, so um, they, you know, there might be an, some sort of impulse or something. They can't even get amped up for it. They can't even get motivated for something. I think those are often the ones that are, um, you know, kind of not even considered because they are. Sometimes they can be very quiet because they're sitting back, taking it all in. Uh, they're tempted to fire off thoughts and often say things uh, they wish they could take back. Uh, I remember a student I had who would oftentimes blurt during a game and I mean this kid was pretty severe in this and I mean he would yell names at other kids um, because it, it was just he was so caught up in the moment and he had that poor impulse control. Um, they might do now and think later. Um, so like I'm just gonna do it and then later on they regret and they think oh my gosh why'd I do that you know um, I took the uh, last pizza piece piece of pizza at the party because I really wanted it even though I've already had three um, and then later they might think really hard about oh my gosh I stole it away and this other kid only had one yeah. and they might feel really bad about that later and or about something that they've done later um, but their impulse control just is not there to make them think of that consequence beforehand and they also overcommit themselves in an effort to be helpful but cannot meet the obligations so I mean their impulse is to say yes to everything I'll do that I'll do that and I'll help with that and I'll do this other thing and then holy cow <laughs> They don't get all of it done because they physically can't and people are um, probably disappointed in them. Um, they must be pleasers. Yes, too. pleasers. Um, they have a hard time calming themselves and we can think about that as people with road rage. They get so worked up and take things personally um, and they cannot talk themselves down. They cannot calm down about something. And sometimes we think about that as you know, just really insignificant little things that just set them off. We might say about those kids, oh my gosh, you just never know where the trigger's going to come for them. Um, they also change their plans at a drop of a hat without considering the impact on others. But, yeah, so just like, you know, her example with the pizza, of course, that, you know, if you put, put yourself into the classroom, that uh, that's the student that, you know, going back up to the top, they're shouting out answers or they're um, basically have pretty much disregard for the rest of the kids in the class, only it's just that they don't ha take the time to process that or process the effects that it has on the rest of the kids. And you might even think about that as when kids are working on group projects. Yes. That kid who just says, well, I didn't get it done or, well, I'm not going to do that part now. And they don't even think about how the group will be affected. Um, also, the kid who's, they might have behavior or um, friendship problems because they say, well, I told so-and-so that I play him, play with him at recess. He's been asking me for three days. And so I told him I'd play with him, but I didn't really want to play that. So I went off to play this other thing. And they don't think about that other kid being disappointed or that they had given their word. The other students are kind of an afterthought. Um, so, um, they don't see them, see themselves as others see them a lot of times. They don't realize they're reacting so bad to others maybe and screaming out some answer or, or something with their impulse control. Um, and so we kind of have to have them see themselves in someone else's eyes. Um, also they're sometimes avoided by peers or picked on. Um, have you ever had that kid who um, he's so explosive or she's so explosive that everybody else just <laughs> away from them and then they might say nobody likes me I don't have any friends well they're just kind of an, a, a volcano explosion most of the kids kind of that can kind of get right in your face right in the other students face and in, in, in uncomfortable um, closeness because they feel like they, they don't have their voice heard or, mm -hmm. or they're just so impulsive that that's how they respond or react to other kids. And they um, also, some kids might pick on that kind of kid in that, um, you know, they see, they, they try to set them off. You know what I mean? And so they can feel kind of picked on in that way that, well, they're just doing what's going to bother me. They're doing it because it's going to get a rise out of me. 
So um, sometimes we have to um, help the other kids and help that kid see themselves a little bit differently. Um, they blame things, um, and I'm sure you've it's seen this their fault. on the playground, mm -hmm. right? Um, I had a kid in my class, well, they didn't tell me all the rules. Well, they're not nice to me. They just call me out, nobody else. Um, they uh, can't see trouble coming. They can't see like, oh gosh, I'm walking down a rocky road here. I better be careful, or I better get out of this situation. And I think um, I see a lot of this with teenagers. Oh, yeah. And I think so, that all the research teenage about teenage brains tell us that kids can't uh, attach a, um, a consequence to their behaviors. And so you see that a lot, those junior high age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they're unable to evaluate their own work and can't see ways to improve performance. So sometimes if you're editing a writing piece with these kids, um, they have a hard time really objectively looking at their own work. In their eyes, it's perfect. Um, and even when you pull out some of the errors and things, they're, they're, they're going to argue with you. Um, mm -hmm. so. They also don't ask for help because they don't even know what they need. Okay, so sometimes, um, we, you know, I would say to a kid in my class, oh gosh, when you're having trouble on this, come up and ask me. I'm happy to help you. They don't even understand it as they go through. So we want them to kind of self-monitor along and we can develop that so that they know when they're having trouble. Right, we have to, that's where you guys come in too. You have to teach them that because they're, they're not processing it in their own brains. They haven't learned that skill. And the cool thing about Paris is that lots of times you have that quiet way of sitting beside them and they'll tell you things that they will not tell yep. their teacher. <laughs> so um, that's a, a really awesome superpower to have that they will come to you and they might um, break down that wall a little bit that they've yeah. built up. And you guys get the opportunity again, as we've mentioned several times, to work sometimes one-on-one -on -one with kids and, and know them better and know their um, what makes them tick. I guess. Yes. Okay, so here's another one of our videos. It's not going to work for us today, but I know that you'll go back to the presentation on our website. Remember that bit.ly slash pairs of ESU8. Um, and here's the marshmallow test. Um, nod your head if you've ever heard about the marshmallow test. So what they do is um, uh, they set a marshmallow in front of a kid and they say, you know, you can have this marshmallow right now, or if you wait, you can have two later when I come back. And so it is so hilarious to watch these kids and some might be playing with their hands and one might start to lick the marshmallow and wouldn't you know, they cannot <laughs> wait to get two. It's very few kids that wait to get two. Yes. So definitely go back and watch it because it, it does, uh, relate very well to what we've already talked about and um, that delayed gratification right <laughs> that oh gosh things will be double for me if I can just wait so and it's a challenge for them obviously so um, we think about our kids in about three categories here too so the first is that inability to delay gratification inability to wait um, it's that kid who can't wait for the second marshmallow they react before thinking. And so for those kids, I really think about them as the ooh, 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 me, yes. me, 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 and the blurter. Jumping out of their seats. Yes. The next type of kid is that kid with an inability to, oh, you know, <laughs> we might just see one of these kids who uh, has <laughs> some impulse that. control right here in the hallway. <laughs> um, uh, but they have an inability to cope with frustration and anger. So again, they escalate quickly and then they don't know how to do anything with it, and they feel really helpless, they feel discouraged, they are like, I, I don't even know how to. The only thing they can focus on is their frustration. There is nothing else that they can focus on, and so those are the ones that um, really are. They're zero tough. to 10 in two seconds and um, can kind of rage. All right, and then we have a kid who is uh, unable to adjust their behavior to a situation. So for me, this was the student in my classroom that I'd say, well, gosh, they never do that in my classroom. Why would they do that for you when they go to music class? Why are they bugging everyone around them? Or maybe, um, gosh, in the classroom, this kid's really good, but 
we go to a program and he acts like a show off to everyone else and, or he starts pestering everyone around him. Yep. So, and you guys probably see that with your students a lot, maybe out at recess um, or the lunch lunchroom. Those, kind of those unstructured times too can bring that a lot. But there are no behaviors in the lunchroom, right? No. <laughs> right? With a wink. <laughs> no reaction? <laughs> so, um, okay, so we can start looking at some of those um, more deeply. So they have that uh, inability to delay gratification. They, they can't put it off. So they can't distinguish um, feelings from actions or wants from needs. So it's, it's all a need, okay? Um, I have to have it, and I'm going to have it right now. And, um, you know, it's like those kids that you say, you know, we're not going to um, do this part until the end. And they're on that part immediately, you know. Um, also, um, the kids who um, they need attention or a higher level of stimulation, they're the class clown, really. Uh, they might be that class clown or that one that wants to be a show off. Um, they're unable to slow down and use self-talk to calm down. Um, that's one that we might really have to focus on with kids. Um, and if you have an elementary guidance counselor or even a guidance counselor at that higher age, ages, mm -hmm. the upper grades, you know, this is something that guidance counselors are really good at doing with kids. But if not, we just say, hey, I understand that you're getting really stressed out at these times. How can we talk you through it? They might also have trouble internalizing different rules and procedures, right? There's our um, playground kid. It has a hard time. Um, they're, they have a limited repertoire for appropriate um, options for responding. Like, hey, when somebody says something I don't like, um, I could give these five responses. They can't do that. They, all they have to just say is, you're mean, and you're always mean to me, and I hate you. <laughs> so um, we have to really help them talk through and say, you know, I really don't appreciate when you say that kind of thing to me or you know I don't think you have all the facts on that actually this is how it should go right and I think the triage idea comes back into play here quite a bit in in teaching them how to triage and how with them um, can help with some of this process for the kids so these kids really need some structure and routine um, and we um, so giving them that and having situations be kind of the same for them helps um, but they're also unsure of how their actions affect others, so we have to help them see that. And I think some of the strategies that we talked about prior to this go back and relate to this as well. So keep those in mind as we, we talk about these different components. So those kids that um, can't cope with frustration or anger, then they feel that discouraged or helplessness. Um, they really can't articulate their problem um, or their feelings. Um, so we have to help them talk it out and help them see what the problem, the root of it might have been. Um, they avoid situations that are too difficult or boring. Um, and so we have to push them to that point that might be frustrating. It might be frustrating to be in um, like learning something example. difficult. Um, I also, I think um, boys with writing sometimes. Um, some of my even most intelligent boys had a hard time with writing and they would panic in it. So I had to help them see how they could get through that. And this test taking um, um, applies here. Mm -hmm. And well. so again, um, kind of helping them predict what's about to happen and see a schedule helps. Um, they retaliate for perceived mistreatment. Well, I hit him because he hit me or I hit him because I didn't like what they said. Um, so it's kind of like everything that they do is a reaction to something else. They can't identify what triggers them. So we have to help them identify the trigger. And yep, talking through that, what are their triggers and what else instead can they do mm -hmm. as a reaction? Um, they also uh, can't reframe things to see that new perspective. Um, so we have to turn the tables, help them see through somebody else's glasses what's going on. And they don't know how to gain power, attention, or control appropriately. Oftentimes, this kid feels very mistreated by others, and they have to feel a little success and feel like, hey, somebody else might like me in this world. So when we can facilitate that and have them have a time to shine, it is really big. I had a student in my class who, you know what? He was just really good at organizing all of our pillows into a cupboard after reading time. And 
we just let him do it. And then we just cheered him on. And, um, actually that was probably a frustrating experience for me to try to do the pillows. So for him to do it was awesome. And he just felt great. And this, this is one of those, um, situations where you can talk to them and process with them about how to get positive attention rather than negative attention. Cause a lot of times when these kids, um, re react or do something, it's, it's usually, seen as a negative or um, they're seeking that negative attention. And, and so this is a way that you can process with them to, um, to come up with ideas that, that in fact will get them positive attention rather than negative. And then again, we have those kids who have that inability to adjust their behavior. So um, uh, they're unaware of how, other, how their behavior affects others. Sorry, it's getting loud here for just a minute. I'll try to talk loud. Or, um, so that clear that kid is unclear about their expectations or goals. We have to help them vocalize those or write those down. Um, uh, they don't pick up on feedback that indicates a need to alter the plan or behavior. Like, oops, um, this came up in the middle, and we now need to switch what we're doing. Um, and um, it's really hard for them to adjust that with peers and um, with other students and teachers so and it might just be hey we're researching something and we found out this bad piece of information and we realized we need to switch our topic oops we have to adjust but um, they might really have a yep. hard time with that they need practice for appropriate behavior and responses okay so let's let them let's say hey okay you're about to do this with your friends role play role will play you play. pretend that you're doing it with me first and then also uh, they can't accurately predict any kind of consequences. Um, so um, they don't know, hey, I'm, I'm doing this one thing and this is what's gonna happen to me in the end. And that's where you can talk to them about, okay, so if you react this way, what's gonna happen? So what else could we do? Again, that goes back to uh, some of the conversation on triage. Um, and sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. It can um, and also this is where the they need a corrective feedback um, for improvement and reinforcement. So, so again, we have to show them right when it happens what's happened and how it needs to change in the future. And if we can get them to start vocalizing that, um, that's all the better. If we don't have to always point it out, but we have to say, let's pause. And they say, oh, in the moment. Yes, yes. in the moment. Um, and then also, um, they're unable to use past experiences to self-correct, okay? They have a hard time learning from the lesson that happened last time. So we just have to keep on pointing it out over and over again. This but, is where you help connect that prior knowledge. And them. if we can correct the behavior right away, then that'll help them um, connect to that past experience. That will really help them. So um, we need to build, and um, we're kind of running short on time, so we're gonna go through this a little bit quickly, but we need to build that language for managing emotions and teach them how to de-escalate, how to calm down. Um, some of them don't see this at home at all. They might have a parent that kind of explodes and then they model mm -hmm. that behavior. So let's teach them how to do that. And over and over and over and consistency with that. And I know sometimes and without you getting, might think, oh. You know, we've, we've gone over this, we've gone over this. Don't say that to them because again, they're not going to be seeing that in their real life yet. So you've got to make that um, connection, I guess, and, and just keep practicing. And we keep might be practicing. so frustrated with them, but they're frustrated too. Yeah. So don't put that out on them. Don't say, haven't we done this enough times? Um, just really give them a lot of grace there and help them out. Um, also, um, reading body signals is hard for these kids. They don't attach emotions um, to facial expressions sometimes, or they don't know. Um, one kid, I had to say, you know, um, when you're in trouble and you're smiling at me, I think that you think it's funny. And that isn't what the kid thought at all. But we had to learn the emotion to go along with the, con the situation. So. You know, um, I've even worked with some kids in abuse settings who um, had to learn facial expressions with emotions. So we really had to show picture cards and facial expressions and for them to be able to um, 
uh, attach those. And can you guys hear us? Would you give us a thumbs up if you can hear us? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. We realize too that you know you guys aren't going to be able to to do practice things like that, like the behavior cards and things. Um, in that manner because you are limited on time but if you take a few minutes to um, to process with them even just like what Stephanie talked about with the you know not smiling when um, you know here's the perception of what we see when you're smiling just talking that through just Mm -hmm. take a couple minutes to talk that through and then we um if we can help kids identify emotional triggers maybe it's a student that they have a trigger with in high school um, maybe it's, or I don't, I shouldn't have said in high school. I just mean that high school Anywhere. kids see more teachers, but maybe it's a teacher. Maybe mm-hmm. the kid and the teacher lock horns. Um, maybe it's a situation or a kind of assignment that they're, um, assigned. Like, like I said, boys in writing that can be kind of hard, but it's also not our job to say, okay, well, you don't get along with this teacher. So you just don't have to take their class. Right. It's more of identifying how the trigger the triggers that they get and how to actually process those in a, in a more positive light. Yep. Um, and anchoring that positive and negative stim- stimulus that, that can really help, um, learning self calming techniques. Maybe they're going to walk to the water fountain and count to 25 as they do it and, and count down from 25 as they come back and be ready. Um, maybe it's breathing. Maybe it's going to sit in the corner. Um, Sensory kids might like to just feel something squishy in their hand or something soft in their hand or a piece of Velcro. I had students over the years who just needed a piece of Velcro to rub their thumb over, and that would really calm them down. And again, with those types of things, you're going to have to try a lot of things before you're going to find something that that works with them. And ask your teacher. Yeah, work with your teachers to say, hey, this is the part that this kid is getting hung up on and and is a trigger for them. Um, Teachers need to know that from you. So they will value your help there. And they may even, because of time restraints, not been able to communicate to you some things that may have worked for them in the past with that student with the same behavior. So it's always important to go back and and talk with them. Um, These kids also need some reframing. So um, they might have something like the story I created in my head or the way I saw it. Through my lens of viewing life, this is how I saw it, that those kids were picking on me. But actually, (laughs) when I was getting in their face and screaming, that's why they tried to avoid me. Or that's why they told me to go away and not play with them. (laughs) So think of, and that's the, wear somebody else's shoes. Yes. Type of thing. And um, you can have some prompts. Like um, the students can uh, illustrate some, like, if this happened, what would you do? Or in this situation, what are you going to do? Um, We need to teach these kids to wait to be called on. These are the blurters. These are the ooh, ooh, oohs. And it's not fair to all the other kids in the class, right, for them to blurt out. So we need to teach them you are not called on until, uh, or you you do not blurt or say an answer until you're called on. And, you know, something as simple as, and I've I've done this for several of my students in the past, is is when a question is asked, you sit on your hands. Because those are the, if you've noticed, those kids are always, a push, something with their hand is moving and so if they're sitting on their hands that's a good cue mm-hmm. for them just something as simple as that and then some kids have um charts to help them self-monitor um and really that discussion and reflection is so important there so they might have a little behavior chart that they get to make a happy face or a sad face on but really talking them through it and saying, now what made that go so well today what what did you struggle with? Was there a time that it was hard, but you did good anyway? Um, and really have that discussion. And also um, those routines. I you know sometimes people think routines are boring, but really <laughs> kids need the routine. They need predictability um, and accountability and being held accountable to hey this is the way we're going to do it and this is what the consequence if we don't. So. Um, and we doing those types of things over and over and over again in following the same routine. So an if then chart is really good. Like if I um, hit someone on the playground, then I blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. If I react positively with my hands on the playground, then I make friends. If I get mad, 
then I, so a coping, yeah. coping mechanism. So um, we have about uh, three minutes for you to think of a student that has poor focusing, uh, self-monitoring or impulse control skills, and think about two things that you might do with that student to help them. And we're going to ask that, we're, we're going to try to ask all of you to share out one as best as we can here in our environment. Or at least one from each school. So actually, let's take yes. three minutes to talk, and then we're just, we'll take a, the, the. So go sure. ahead, talk, talk, talk. We're going to call on you. I only see one group conversing, couple groups. We are gonna call on you. Right? No, mm -hmm. I, I can't. You can. Yeah, you can. You should be able to. Oh, on your view. Click on that view. Oh. Oh, I'm, okay. not, I'm not on it. It's not me. Right. Should we just go down from the top? Yep. Okay, Cindy's site. I'm going to guess that that's up in Butte. Oh, we have Lynn. So that's okay. I'll get to her. Hold on, Cindy, just a second here. Okay, nice and loud for us. Who is, describe your student and, and two strategies that you would use. And by describing your student, maybe use some of the components that we talked about, like with impulse control and, and focusing. Sometimes if our student has trouble focusing and just can't handle the situation, we take a break and go for a walk. Okay. When you go for a walk with that student, are you still processing the information or do you just completely take a break from the information and come back? We have to take a completely break. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut my video off for just a second because we actually... Well, I'm just going to pause the video so I don't make them dizzy when I walk in there. So give me just a second here, and then we'll finish up with our conversation. Okay, maybe I won't. I'm just going to walk. So I apologize here. Give me just a second. There. Okay, guys, now we have some quiet. Sorry about that. Okay, we were just with Cindy. And Cindy, thank you for sharing. Good job. Um, how about Lynch? Uh, B, uh, it says BC Lynch. That's us. Mm -hmm. Yep. Can, can, can you hear us? Yes. yes. Can you hear us? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Uh, what I do like in reading, if they're one particular student, if they're not focusing, I keep telling them, looking at me, we'll go over the material. I also tell them if we get through this material and they'll get some extra free time, otherwise we just keep repeating until we get it over right. When they're not focused and want to goof around, this time of year it's getting harder. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. Do you have any of your um, students who tried to or have you tried to cover um, some of the extra information or use a um, like a postcard or anything to highlight what the reading? Have you? Have they tried that at all? For highlighting it? Highlight or underline or cover up some of the extra. I know you, you mentioned reading. I'm, I'm talking, yeah, we've done that, but usually what I'm talking about is when we're doing the verbal part. Oh, sure. Before they start on their workbook or anything. Okay, all right. But keeping them focused there sometimes is hard. Yeah, that's great. Okay, thanks for sharing. Let's move on to, it says Herrera. There's some upset. Yeah. Herrera, are you guys there? We unmuted you so you can hear. Okay, that's okay. Let's let's move on because we're short on time here. But how about Spencer? 
Do you guys have anything you'd like to share, or your student, or some processes? So they're all looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have one student that has trouble focusing. If the teachers let him doodle, huh? he will absorb the entire lecture. Mm -hmm. If they take that away, then he's repetitive noises, he's in and out of his seat, disruptive. Yeah, but, and, you think, and you think they're messing around drawing, but they really need it. So no, that's, he's good, that's a good strategy. Highest testers in the middle, you know, in his class. So Full disclosure here, that was me as a child. <laughs> I can <laughs> relate. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. All right, moving on to Rue Ribe. I'm not sure. <laughs> Are you there? All right, that's okay. I don't see any faces there. So if I'm, I missed you, need to come back, let me know. How about Norfolk? Do you have something you'd like to share or could share with us? Um, we can you hear me? Yep. Okay, we have several students that we work with that have the inability to focus in class. And we came up with some ideas that we use. Um, we break down their directions for them so that it's not so much at once. Not so overwhelming. Yep. Yes. yes. Um, give a lot of short breaks in between, you know, longer class periods. Some, some of these kids here have a language arts class that goes maybe two periods long. So that becomes too much. So we'll give them breaks. And a lot of fresh air if we can get them outside or even just a quick walk around the building outside absolutely fresh air there's something about it yep. great thank you um, oh go ahead the consequences and just make sure you follow through with those consequences absolutely if otherwise they learn really quickly that you're yeah. all talking no action okay thank you for sharing norfolk and how about stewart, stewart. go ahead Okay. I, ha I have a student that um, if he starts getting off task, what I just do is I set the timer light for two minutes and then he can play with whatever he wants. He usually uh, loves trains. So mm -hmm. like two minutes, he'll get to play the train. And as soon as the timer goes off, then we got to get back to doing what he was up now or whatever we were doing. That's and great. That is he able to refocus pretty well then if because you're really giving him a brain break. that timer when it goes off he knows it's time if i didn't have a timer he probably wouldn't yeah yeah i like that cue that's an auditory cue for him or for them to come back that's a great great share thank you thanks so much everybody for sharing out so well today that's awesome yeah we kept and, you a little long so. yes we have kept you long but we just want to say um thanks so much for joining us this whole year on this para adventure and we hope that you have just a wonderful holiday season. Um, we are one of those lucky professions that gets a holiday break. And so use it as a time to recharge, do something just for you. Um, and you know, this time of year, it does get to be that frustration point for all of us um, in the field. And so, um, you know, really do something to calm yourself and relax and come back recharged in January. This is your brain break time, so enjoy it. And I hope that each of the kids, um, families, and teachers that you work with will let you know how much they appreciate you at this time of year because really, you are the superheroes in the school. You help so much, and I know we feel and as dad. former classroom teachers, we couldn't have made it without you. So you do something so important every day. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. So thank you, guys, and have a great holiday. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.